All right, folks. Hey, Sean, good to see you. Sean is from Ontario joining us tonight. I know we'll have a bunch more folks be joining us. Um, Luke, welcome to the uh, to the live, I guess. I guess it's the uh, the Growing Farmers Live. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael. It's good to be here. All right. Well, so we'll get we've got about 10 folks on already. So guys, let us know in the comments where you're listening from, what the weather is, where you guys are. I'm always interested to hear what's uh, happening there. Today was actually um, an unusual day. I actually spent most of the day outside. We had our videographer come for today. Um, and he will be coming to the farm about once every two weeks, then once every month to uh, be shooting, helping us shoot new content. We're finally to the point where we can outsource that. And so that's going to be really, really nice. So I actually spent out time outside. We were shooting. We actually visited three farms today. So that was um, exciting to be shooting content with those farmers as well. So, but uh, yeah, so let us know where you're listening from in the comments. And uh, Luke, why don't you give us a little bit of background about you and uh, kind of your ag journey? Yeah, well, hey, thank you. Uh, first of all, for all you're doing, it's such an honor to be here and to be a part of um, all of that you're going on as we've built a little bit of a relationship. I know I've spent a lot of hours out in the field uh, being encouraged by your podcast and hearing other people and their stories and what they're working on. Um, my journey in farming uh, kind of took off right after I graduated college. I actually don't have an ag background, but uh, saw potential in 2011. I started farming uh, semi-commercially. I was actually not even close to an organic farmer. Um, I was naturally grown, but I... At the time, I didn't even believe that organic was a good thing. I actually believed that it was the way to global starvation and was pretty outspoken about it. <laughs> it was really embarrassing, um, you know, having this conversion experience later on in life. But I got into some other things and then ended up um, in Missouri, and I landed in a small town called Donovan, Missouri. And actually at my church, I got connected with this company called Agrigrow. And through Agrigrow, I, I still I had that, that farming bug and that, that niche, you know, I just needed to scratch or that itch I needed to scratch in farming. And uh, so I did a big garden and, and was kind of rolling and really impressed with these products in AgriGrow. And then I started doing some research, probably trying to prove uh, organic wrong. And yeah. somehow, obviously, you watch Food Inc. and then you see this really smart farmer, Joel Salatin, uh, kind of an icon in in American farming. And I, I just dove into Salatin whole hog. Um, and that was probably early, late 2015, early 2016. Um, and just went all in, uh, on my little homestead hobby farm thing that I was doing. Um, and, and just dove in studying headlong. I'm kind of an all in kind of guy. And then life led us back to Arizona. And I, at that time, I wanted to jump back into full-scale agriculture, and I wanted to prove some of the principles that Salatin taught. Mm -hmm. So I approached somebody, and I, I started a farm on lease ground. I lived in a fifth wheel, did what it took. And then, long story short, we had a fairly successful farm that we were running, um, you know, running wide open, selling hundreds of, of tomatoes a week, hundreds of pounds of tomatoes. We had, like, 1,500 vines and all the mixed veg. Um, and I used AgriGrow through that, and I was kind of doing three different things. I became a distributor for AgriGrow, and I was farming, and I was applying these products actually in the the, the landscape space. I had a deep root injection and was doing stuff like that. So, yeah. So you were farming and you're also doing the uh, the tree the tree care and the tree health, that sort of thing. Um, so talk to us about where you were farming, because that's actually a pretty unique environment. Uh, in Arizona? Yeah. Yeah. So I was farming in the, if you know where Arizona is, we, we, you throw a dart and you're right at the dead center of the state. That was Cottonwood, Arizona. That's where I was at. Um, very, very extreme climate, um, high elevation, high desert, extremely dry. Um, our humidity, a high humid day is like 12% humidity. Um, and this, this past year we faced, it was like 113 um, six weeks straight, we didn't have a monsoon, no rain. Uh, but then, because we were high desert, we would actually have um, very, very cool nights. So the disparity between, you know, three to four in the afternoon being 110, 105, somewhere in there, it would actually swing all the way down to 60 degrees. Um, and plants don't like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
yeah it's challenging yeah and i think the thing with that those temperatures is just the even the solanaceous crops which love that temperature they they really struggle right and and so during the day you know they're they're curling their leaves just to try to have a little bit less sun pressure um, yeah and and it looks like you're fighting a bunch of diseases but you might not be and so you're trying to really balance is this sun pressure is this disease and yeah it, it's challenging so yeah yeah absolutely um so let's talk a little bit um I, we kind of like you know talked about your background let's talk a little bit about soil health because i know that's something that obviously in arizona is challenging obviously i've farmed all over the u.s and um and uh that's been challenging too let's talk a little bit about you know what's the different aspects of soil health that we need to be talking about well i think number one um first and foremost we want to be focusing on organic matter when you have a healthy organic matter soil you're going to begin it to naturally be having these breakdowns of npk for npk i mean if you have a three percent organic matter in your soil or greater you're actually producing an npk npk value ongoing in yeah. to your plant um, outside of that you have your, your basics you've got your calcium calcium is so important and then not only with the calcium you have to have the right ratios to cal to mag ratio uh, your magnesium um, and then obviously we go down the list. You have your pH, which is super important. Out west, when you're in the super dry climate, um, super alkaline soils for the most part. Everything I've tested out in, in southwest, west coast, arid climates, your pH is through the roof high. Um, like my, my pH on this particular ground was an 8.3. Wow. 8.3 pH. Um, the water that I was sourcing was right in that range as well. Um, very, very challenging with that high of a pH. Plants want to be a whole lot lower than that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, what else, what else are you thinking in terms of soil? Yeah, so, I mean, so you, that's the thing is like, you've got the chemical side. So you've got, you know, the chemical side, the maize, your pH is your phosphorus, potassium, all your micronutrients. But then we <laughs> also have the biological side. And that is the side that I think we are every single year, we're finding out crazy new things about right. How can we get the soil more biologically active, more healthy, more uh, cool things in the soil, which are actually you know, uh, pushing forward the fertility? Right. Because what we're discovering, and, and more and more every single year, we're discovering, all right, this soil is actually its own ecosystem. Um, yeah. There's, there's bacteria. There's, there's, there's this whole war going on <laughs> of eat or be eaten um, yeah. in terms of bacteria and right at that level is where we begin to see most of the health situations taking place. We see a lot of um, disease strains get cleared away as organic matter increases, as the right levels of beneficial bacteria um, begin to rise, um, as earthworms begin to come back. Um, all these things that over the years conventional ag has kind of been doing to try to increase yields we found this negative effect that begins to take place at the at the soil level, and we it, it, we, we weren't able to see it. Um, I, I think initially. Now we're choosing ease of application over what's right for your soil, and that's where this discussion begins to get opened up, and people are going, "Whoa, we're we've missed stuff." Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, you know, you've got some awesome people out there like, uh, you know, a, a, um, like Nicole uh, Masters, um, you know, the Gabe Browns, Ray Archuletos. You've got the uh, Elaine Ingram who's doing some really cool stuff right. with compost teas and stuff. Um, so, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's stuff being done. But I think that the, one of the big problems is, is like, how do you simplify this? I think we just said there's, you know, how do you simplify this going from these really complicated things to something that's a little bit easier for the farmer that's super overwhelmed and got a lot going on right now. So, right. So, so really within that biological gap, everything we're trying to do is, is merge genetic yield potential of what that seed is. Yeah. Uh, and, and that genetic yield potential, how can we bring our soil health up to a point to maximize that as close as we can get? Because yeah. we're not actually seeing that maximization take place, yeah, um, at, at any sort of level. 
So. Yeah. Okay. And so let's let's kind of break that down for folks. I mean, what does if we're increasing the biological activity of the soil, what is that actually doing, and how are the plants benefiting? Well, I mean that that's the <laughs> that's the whole discussion. But I think what what happens uh, so far underneath the surface is your plant isn't actually able to have the nutrient uptake if the nutrient might be available in your soil. Um, so it might be, uh, to, to use an analogy, it might be locked behind something. It could be locked behind pH. It could be locked yeah. behind the core ratio between calcium and magnesium. And your plant, it, it's not water soluble to the plant. And that plant, it, that those minerals can't travel through the root structure um, yeah. and, and break cell walls and actually go up into the plant to create a little bit of a healthy environment for nutrient uptake. Yeah. Yeah, because what you've got is it's just it's it's not being able to be accessed, and and because the plant's roots actually aren't what's getting the nutrients, it's the soil life which is actually helping make that connection in many of the cases. Right, that the soil life and the bacteria and 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 the protozoa and the fungus and all of those things as they play uh, an important role, they're kind of like the metabolism of soil. Yeah, uh, and and minerals are inert it's the minerals need to go to the plant but but they're they can't get there it can't metabolize and so it breaks down and, and it's not actually traveling as a nutrient to your to the to the plant in the same way our body works yeah. if, if our gut health is completely out of whack um we are unable to move our nutrients into our bloodstream to get to um those those different different areas of our body that's that's why the the health and wellness industry you go down the aisles of your store and what do you see you see vitamin c and every mineral under the sun and everything and it's a multi-billion dollar industry because people have recognized oh i'm missing a little bit of this and i need some of this for healthy hair and nails and yeah etc 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 all the way down the line and it's the same it's the same traffic. We don't just want to look at minerals when we're looking at our soil. We want to look at how can we um, create a healthy environment um, within there. Yeah, absolutely. So I know we tease people here with talking about, you know, prebiotics versus probiotics. So let's kind of like break that down. Well, prebiotics is, is truthfully relatively a new term. Um, we didn't really understand it when it first started. When AgriGrow first started, we didn't necessarily use the term prebiotic because we didn't quite understand what a prebiotic was. Yeah. Um, I think we were in the biological realm, and I think we were probably marketing as a probiotic. But as we began to break down our specific formula and discover a lot of stuff and look at it closer and deeper under the microscope and, and how we're culturing bacteria and putting it uh, into uh, a concentrate to where we can actually utilize this in a, in a, a decently easy setting context, um, there, there's two main differences. Pre, there's no live microbes in the, in the bottle. Um, there's no live microbes, detectable live. There might be dormant strains. There, it's all derived from, from beneficial bacteria. It's dormant, but it's not actually live. So a live bacteria is like an animal. It's going to move around and it's going to digest and do things. That's why a lot of uh, probiotics that are on the market, they, that contain live bacteria strains, they actually have a shorter shelf life um, because that, they will change in the bottle similar to poorly um, poorly done uh, canning. If you don't can right, you're gonna have bacteria in that bottle and that shelf life isn't gonna be extended. Um, in, the yeah. same, in the same way, um, when you're a bottling company or a bottling agency, everything's gotta be um, in, in order. So there's all these different probiotics in the mic out there. With that, the more types of bacteria that you put in a, in a probiotic context or form, the more they're going to interact with one another in the bottle. And so they're usually not able to have many more than four strains of bacteria in the bottle. Now, the agrogrow difference with the prebiotic lines, because everything is um, fermented and brought back on a proprietary level, they, they're actually... Uh, our products are derived with more than 30 different family strains of bacteria. Yeah. Uh, over 400 biomolecules within 
any jug that you get of of agro depending on on what yeah what it is um with the exclusion of our calcium so yeah all the biological line so so Cal, let's kind of like uh like bring that back for folks is that because let's say a probiotic the the bacteria is typically alive in the bottle what you're saying they can right. have four things in there normally and the shut they have a very they have to worry about their shelf life their shelf life is right, right. And, and oftentimes within that to have to have the correct uh level of results you have uh, there's a lot of refrigerated products out there yeah um and you have you know handling is it's a little bit more challenging agro is not like that yeah. uh, one of the things that is that is very interesting about the prebiotic is you're not only um, introducing these dormant strains of, of of bacterias within the soil. You're actually stimulating the native species. So I, I know on some of your your podcasts, I've heard a lot of conversations within Korean natural farming and and you know, taking different bact bacteria samples and trying to culture these and yeah. and and rice and create your own biologicals, which is really good practice. Um, this is a little bit. Um, you're, you're going to be doing some of those same things by using agrogrow. Um, and only it's a whole lot <laughs> easier for the user. Yeah. Uh, you're not trying to mess it up and you can mess up compost teas very, very quickly. Um, you can get bacterial infections. I've done it. I've, I've made some compost teas, uh, com yeah, compost teas and I'm um, spraying them on. A, I don't, something's not right. It had to have been something that I did because I, I crossed something up along the way and didn't get the results I was looking for. Exactly. Yeah. We got a question from Mike in the chat. Is there an argument that modern varieties need synthetic inputs such as fertilizers to grow full potential along with spacing and cultivation? Uh, modern varieties of, I'm of assuming, plants? Yeah. I'm assuming plants. I mean, like, obviously there's the aspect of there's so many, like, are you talking corn or soy or, um, you know, vegetables. I, I, I mean, some of the modern varieties are being bred at such a rate and with such a real potential that they need a lot of fertility. So, um, how you supply that can be different ways. Obviously a very easy way is just to give them, you know, massive amounts of fertility, um, you know, we love to do lots of compost because we feel that it actually gives a better quality plant overall, um, and give it, you know, um, but I, I don't know, Luke, what do you say? I would say that's, I could believe it, yeah. but I would say that would be tending towards large ag from seed companies like Monsanto, um, but it's almost like the conspiracy theories we see in our government it's on both sides. I'm not exactly sure. Um, it seems to me that that could be a case if the seed company was the owner of the, the synthetic fertilizer company. Um, because you're, they, the goal for them is to try and make money and not necessarily help or feed the world. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I don't think from your basic feed companies or seed companies that that's going to be a large factor at play. Um, from from everything I saw early on is through NPK and synthetic, a plant doesn't look like it knows the difference in terms of its response. However, the flavor spectrum, the aroma spectrum, the, the depth of which that plant responds to the synthetic form versus a organic form is different. Yeah. It, uh, absolutely different. And you have some of these top chefs in the world saying, no, 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 I don't want that. I need the one that's produced with the compost tea because the flavor profile is so much different. Mm -hmm. um, so, Like it's very interesting. We almost hired someone that used to work at the chef's garden. And actually the, I told him, look, I can't hire you at the moment, but I want to hire you in six months. So mm -hmm. and I, said, I know you can't wait for me, but, uh, yeah. uh, but I really want to hire you still because basically his job was research there and just talking to him about the research they were doing. Um, they sold to the most discerning chefs in the world. And it was amazing how organic their practices were. Right. Because right. of that 
flavor profile that they know and the, the things they were playing around with just blew my mind. I mean, the special fertilizers and stuff just to kind of um, shift, you know, how things are growing. So, yeah, I mean, like, yes, you absolutely. Um, to clarify, we try to mimic nature, but don't see tomatoes in nature. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, like, you're right. Don't, <laughs> but they taste so good. <laughs> yes, we don't see these big, ripe, fancy fruits in nature. Um, so I, I, I absolutely exactly what you're saying is we are trying with what we're trying to do. We're trying. We're we're creating an in, um, an in, untrue or like basically synthetic environment. So there would be a, a point where you could say you would, in that synthetic environment you might need synthetic fertilizers. But I guess I would go back and say like putting down a ton of chicken manure. Uh, in pellets under the soil, that's not natural either. I mean, like, how does that normally happen? No. Um, well, we, don't, we, don't see, yeah. we don't see forests of tomatoes. Uh, Correct. Yes. However, uh, they've been around for a very, very, very long time. And um, cultivating tomatoes, uh, depending on the variety, I'm not like a huge – you know, I'm going to grow square tomatoes so they can stack, you know, in, in my, in my crate. And I want them with very thick skin so that they ship and I'm going to pick them green. All of those decisions that we're making are, are poorly based. Um, and I do know this, that my field has volunteered tomatoes all the time. Yeah. Year after year. And yeah. So I think, you know, kind of wrap it up, Mike, that was a long way to say yes and no, that um, if we if we really work on the biology and get the biology where we want it and the soil balance where we want it, we do see organic systems absolutely crushing the production, blows our mind away with what you can get for production. Um, and th I think the other big advantage of that is the resilience of that. The problem is when you move into, let's say, completely synthetic, which to me the most synthetic would be a hydroponic system, is that if one thing goes wrong, you can screw it up. And we actually just chatted with Stan Boletsky. Um, no, uh, I'm going to, yeah, um, uh, on the podcast. And that was one of his big things was, yeah, hydroponics awesome. We do a lot of stuff with it. But it's incredibly challenging, and you can mess it up really fast. Right. So, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, there's definitely. I think Mike, you get you do have a point there that we are create because of our breeding, we are creating a natural system. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's kind of dive into because you mentioned AgriGrow a couple times, um, and you've used you've now been using that, and you work for them. So talk to us a little bit. About, but actually, let's before we get into that. What's the problem in the industry? Because we've talked about how, okay, we're seeing adding soil life is important. It's helping. It's making things grow faster, better, stronger. Um, but there is a problem in the industry. And what is that problem? Uh, tackling what is what is the entirety of the problem? Of yeah, so sorry, what is the problem with people who are trying to dive into this? biological side of things um you know they're, they're just repackaging things that aren't really going to help there is a lot of snake oils out there if that's what you're talking about yeah so some people are back packaging a biological stimulant and there's a lot of people out there selling a lot of different products um that are not getting good results i was actually looking at some some trials um i can actually probably bring one up here um here's a trial let me see if I can figure out how to jump to this. Uh, share my screen here. Um, share screen. I don't know if I can do this. Is Can you guys see that? Uh, you should be able to. There's a share button at the bottom of your screen. I'm not seeing anything yet, Luke. How about there? Ah, I see a... Th yep, I can add that to screen. There we go. Yep. So here's an example of uh, just a little piece of advertising that's that's been done. Do you still see it? Yeah, can you zoom in on that though? Maybe hit the command plus symbol. A couple times. Uh, cool. Yeah, if I knew where my plus sign was, okay, let's let's try this. Yes. If you can do a little bit more, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, now scroll up. Beautiful. Okay, so, 
So what's going on here is this is a, a study that was done using Ultra uh, for corn in, out of West Bend, Iowa in 2017. So when you look at this, um, you see competitor A, competitor B, competitor C, competitor D. When you go into a, a third party context through a university, you can actually, as a chemical producer, you can choose to say this is this is A, this is B, this is C, and not actually say the name of the product. So if you look over here, the check value, this was the check field. This was not used in a product. <laughs> so that had no product in it. It was better than all the competitors. That's correct. So there are things that you can do from competitors that can mess up your soil. Yeah. We always use our label because we want, uh, granted this is our, our advertising, but we do use our label because we are wanting to, um, yeah, we're, we're wanting to show what we have. Um, and all of our tests, they're coming back, you know, over and over and over again for 40 years of how agro products have continually across every different context um, made a huge difference. And, and we don't roll a product out unless we know that we can stand by that confidently. Um, that's where some of the competitors, they want, they want to make it. And so they're going to roll a product out and they're going to say, Hey, here we go. Let's try this. And it's not actually working for the client, but yeah, it's, it's lucrative for the, the salesman. And then you, yeah, because then, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ways to make your product look good. Um, yes. And that kind of thing there. And I, I think the thing is too, I mean, we can kind of like shift into like talking about your company in AgriGrow is mm -hmm. I mean, think about AgriGrow, which, you know, when you, we started chatting, cause um, I mean, we met through, you know, we, uh, you, we were hiring a position on a farm. Someone hired me to bring, find a farmer. You kind of apply. We met through that whole, that whole process. Um, but, you know, we started talking about, you know, how you guys have been in the industry for 40 years and for a company to be in the industry for 40 years. I mean, you guys were in existence before people knew what was actually, actually in what you sold. Right. Yeah. The founder, Ron Smith, um, really saw the potential of it in the early 80s and what it was doing. Um, the The scientist behind it was actually Dr. Sproul. There was eight guys in a lab, uh, very, very early 80s, that were working um, in several different capacities. And one of which was, um, he, he's better known for his work in stabilizing aloe vera uh, for, for the human body and using aloe vera as topicals and sunburn care and all that stuff. Um, and and through that, this biological element was, was born. Um, and, and so Ron saw the potential, they started using it all over and he started manufacturing it. Um, and as Dr. Sproul passed away, uh, the founder Ron Smith started AgriGrow and that was when, um, he started selling this to the commercial ag. So when you think back in the early eighties, this is all pre internet, this is pre, um, huge, you know, ways to connect. And so it pretty much started with him in a station wagon going farm to farm saying, will you try this? Will you try this? Will you try this? This is changing. This is going to change the world. And yeah. then over the years it became, there's all these questions because people were seeing it and they were trying to create like products. And then that's when the whole snake oil, um, uh, but like bugs in a jug, snake oil, that all, all the people that don't actually believe in the product, um, there's been bad names associated all the way down the line from, from poor study, poor advancement, um, inferior products. And so they've been proving it over and over and over again. And that's where they crawled into the commercial ag space. Cause they were saying, this is better for the environment. We need to stop using as much petroleum based fertilizers. We need to be focusing on the biological element on soil health and developing that. And that's still uh, to this day, the mission and the catchphrase is just add life. We don't want to be doing anything that destroys the soil. We cannot do that. If we want to sustain life, we've got to add life. But unfortunately, until our movement of small scale farmers really takes a, a firm grip and, and we, and we, to, to talk about JM, um, replace uh, mass production by production by the masses. Until that takes place, we're not going to do that. So big ag isn't going anywhere. And so AgriGrow's mission is still helping our planet by reducing the amount of petroleum-based fertilizers and slowing the speed at which yeah. um, we're destroying our planet. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. The thing is, too, is like, 
well, you guys have you have people farmers again and again and again buying the same product. And as you right. said, farmers don't buy snake oil twice because if it doesn't work, it doesn't pencil out. Then it right. is. Uh, right. Let me tell you about a, a a farmer that's been using the product for almost thirty years. His name's Billy Bader. Um, he's in um, Southeast Missouri over here. He's he's a huge orchard. Uh, yeah. He's one of the bigger peach producers out there, um, and he he believes so much in these products. He uses these products all through the orchard, all through the growing season. There's times when you have an early frost that comes through um, in the peach industry. Everybody knows about early frost in trees, where yeah. you're at right at bloom, you're right at blossom, and then you have this this late late frost. Um, you know, April May, you, you you lose a good portion of your crop. There's been times where there's lines between his his orchard and other people's orchard to where his orchard is actually a couple degrees warmer because there's more organic matter in that soil over 30 years of using the product and he doesn't he doesn't actually experience damage on his leaves in the frost and his neighbors do yeah and 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 that's just a testament of developing organic matter over time yeah developing organic matter and i think the other thing of building resiliency into the the trees, mm -hmm. and and that's typically done through when you add higher sugars, because the sugars could then help the plants resist those cold. And adding sugar means your bricks is up, which means your sweetness is up as well, typically. So you're kind of seeing the whole the whole aspect there, right? Uh, yeah. Let me show you a Lincoln. Let me jump on again on the uh, screen share and show yep. you a Nebraska study um, where it shows. Uh, Screen sharing, share screen. Um, it's not coming up here yet. Is that showing yet? Not quite yet. There we go. It allowed me to. Nutrient availability. Um, this was a study shown by using AgriGrow. Um, the the amount of nutrient availability that was increased in the soil and then in the plant tissue. Um, so you can see the green there is the nutrient increase in the available in the soil and then nutrient increase that was shown in the plant tissue levels. Um, and, you know, things that you don't actually want, we've, we've been proven to actually help reduce sodium levels in in soils of, of poor alkalinity. So I don't know if you can see that, just the 56.2, um, uh, amazing results. Yeah, Molly Billium. That's something that's like, man, that's cr that went crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was in that study in that context, and it's going to change a little bit um, yeah. over time. But that's that's a really cool um, analysis and a really cool study that was done. Uh, I think it's interesting to note just the phosphorus um, available phosphorus in the soil was so much greater than what ended up coming through on the plant. Um, yeah. in the plant tissue. I think that's an interesting um, point because most of these are fairly close. Um, well, boron uh, tissue availability was through the roof compared to the soil availability. But uh, that's that's some of the the things about a, a quick jump start yeah. um, of your soil. Yeah. All right, so we've talked about the product, talked about the company, um, and you guys are worldwide. I mean, I, I know like when I was there, when I was able to visit, because we were coming back from vacation and we were literally going right by it and you were down there like, hey, just swing in and just see what's yeah, going yeah. on. Um, but you know, one of the owners was on with, what was it, Chile or South America somewhere? Yeah, um, AgriGrow right now um, has jumped into a lot of the, a lot of the export, um, situations i think right now we are available in 40 different countries um it's been pretty pretty amazing um still us is is obviously the primary we are located in southeast missouri um and and we're going to uh, say that we're in a country <laughs> you know when we're in india and maybe one guy that has filled out the export paperwork and has bought yeah. some product yeah. so it's probably not as crazy as you think we do have a pretty good presence in mexico pretty good presence in in uh, Argentina, there's a lot of product that goes down there. Um, we're we're situated pretty close to the Mississippi River, and a lot of that's all um, ship shipped on a shipped on a ship. Yeah, barge. Yeah, yep. barge. yeah. Float, floated out. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so, and I think the thing too, is we talked about how they've really gone after the conventional ag because those guys are putting the pencil to the paper and they know exactly what's working. And so obviously they, you can show very easily the, hey, this will increase your tillage cost, this will up your yield, how many bushels an acre. And right. that's the cost, this is the yield jump, so it's actually worth actually going and spraying that on. But I think what, you know, kind of like you started using it, you're on a very small scale. Mm -hmm. and you check that out to me. I was like, well, there's some actually farmers, and this would for small scale farmers, this would work really well in some very specific instances. I think, you know, most farmers will really work for it. Um, okay. I think part of the reason why, you know, we're having the conversations we are and we'll be doing trials here on our farm this year is because we're still trying to figure out exactly how it's going to affect and what the, the yield jump and stuff is going to be for the small farm. And I think it could be really cool in some instances um, because, again, the thing is, with the prices we get for vegetables, any yield jump is just hugely beneficial. Very, very much so. Yeah. And and kind of detrimental. I mean, if you lose, you know, let's just say you planted one row of broccoli and that was your variety and, and you were planning on bringing that to market or people were excited about it and you, you threw it out there to your CSA and um, yeah. you had a lot of takers on it and then you weren't able to deliver. Um, for X, Y, or Z, that those are the, the challenges, the daily challenges of a farmer. Yeah. Um, so, I, and then actually, you guys have a broccoli study, and that's one of the cool studies that like really th um, threw me through a loop. You want you have that study in front of you? I can pull up. Uh, no, I didn't bring that because I thought you. <laughs> I do. I do have that study here. Let me see if I can pull it up here. I know it's here somewhere. Is it just called broccoli? Yeah, here it is. I'll go ahead. Yeah. So that broccoli study. I mean. Uh, it was a, it is a little bit dated. I mean, because yeah. row has been so much um, of the focus of, of the company has been in the, the commercial um, sector, all the studies are, are in commercial zones. And so this was probably, uh, it was a, yeah, California broccoli producer. Um, yeah. 12. Um, so what, what I to say about that commercial broccoli thing, because this is something that, um, you know, when I see these studies and I see the yield jump, because these are this, I mean, if you look at the, the brand or sorry, not the um, church brother growers, that's a box you will see in any grocery store. So yes. these are the best of the best growers producing on thousands and thousands of acres. And I guess what I would say for those guys to be seeing the jump yield, they are right there, you know, 75 percent jump yield. And, I, and my question is like, okay, so what happened the next year? We don't, I don't see the study, but um, it must have done something crazy for them because to see that kind of jump, that's that's pretty remarkable. Right, and and those studies uh, usually when it's right there with a farmer, they're a side by side. They're a trial based study, and what happens is, uh, like myself, we start out trying to do side by side studies, and we say, I can't afford not to. Yeah, um, I started out. <laughs> Uh, trying to prove to the world and just show some of these side-by-side -side studies. And I was like, you know what, as a farm that knows yeah. how to farm, I can't afford not to use this product on every day. So you kind of ditched the study and just dumped it on the whole field. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is what it is. So let's talk about that because that's something, you know, you know, obviously I'm always very interested in new, cool, awesome stuff for our farm. And, you know, I always love to tell people about cool, new, awesome stuff. But one of the things I chatted with you guys about is like, look, I think this is a cool product. And again, we've already done some tests um, with some of the other products, been incredibly um, uh, surprised with the results of that. And uh, so we're, you know, daily users of that now. But um, we really want, we're going to be start using these for three very specific trials this season on the farm. And uh, so that's where we're going. We got three specific times. We can talk about that. But one of the things I came to you with was like, look, not only do I want to be doing trials, but I would like to kind of replicate this with multiple growers across the U.S. Right. Right. Because, because um, again, my soil is different. My uh, context is so different than the other farmers we have. And so that's where I came to you guys about doing like a, a larger trial and really saying, how can we support growers through that? Um, so that's why we're, we're, we're kind of what we're offering now is this, uh, you know, kind of doing a group trial with different folks for this product. And uh, but I think we got to figure make sure like we we do it right, because I don't the, the worst thing that can happen 
is you give someone product. Um, and we don't like to give giveaway product. We like to, you know, we try to give them a discount or something, but we want them to be financially invested themselves so that they um, are going to make sure they follow through with the study. Right, right. So do you want to talk to them about like kind of what uh, what a good trial looks like? No, I want you to. <laughs> <laughs> so you're Michael yeah. Patrick. You're the pro. <laughs> I don't know about that, but so I, so the three trials we're going for, and the biggest thing with a trial is you've got to be able to have clear A, B comparison. So it's not one thing to say, oh, I've got this field. It's kind of crappy. I'm going to throw the product on that because I think I'll get a better yield there. And if it gets a better yield, great. If not, then, you know, it's, I can blame it on the field. Um, but what you really are, so a good A, B trial is you've got six rows of tomatoes and you have three rows are planted in mix of varieties and the other three rows are planted in the same mix of varieties. So again, you want to be same varieties, not like one variety versus another. And then you split it down the middle and then you do one with the control and one with the product. And then obviously if you're doing a blind study and this is tough, if you're a single you know, farmer doing it by yourself, a blind study would be, you don't actually know which one's getting the fertility and the employee is doing that. And then at the end of the year, you're like, okay, here's the two yields, you know, which one actually had the better yield or which one resisted frost better or which one um, packed out bigger fruit. Because one of the trials you sent me on potatoes, the actual overall yield was down a little bit. But the very interesting thing was the grade one potato was up substantially. Right. So it wasn't – it didn't give massive yields. It gave better yields that actually more pack out rate. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that's the kind of thing that we're looking at here is so that, so doing a good trial is that way. Um, and another thing too, which is kind of tough is let's say you want to do the trial in the greenhouse and you want to use a foliar application. Well, unless it's two greenhouses right next to each other, there's going to be a very hard time to only spray three rows and not get any drift on the other three rows. So, right. Right. And a couple of things on drift when you are developing and stimulating um, native bacteria. Yeah. Uh, there's travel. They've, yeah. they've actually done studies where there's detectable. Um, sometimes you can get really clear lines. Yeah. Um, and, and there's some videos that we have of drone footage flying over a corn. That's just amazing. You go, you know, it's a really tough corn year and this they're flying over and you got these really cool, like, treated versus non-treated lines. And that, those are always amazing for marketing. They're amazing for selling. Um, but a lot of times it's not like that. A lot of times there is that that drift of, of microbial uh, explosion that's taken place in the soil. And yeah. they've been able to detect on some studies where it's actually our product will travel six feet um, of soil that is treated and soil that is not in terms of yeah. benefits all the way along, along and detectable traces of that um, of that foliar application. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we're trying a couple things we're trialing on is we will be doing it in the greenhouse with tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers. Um, and that's going to be a basically, um, because again, it's really hard to spray one row and not the other. Um, we are going to be doing like different rows, like a row of cucumbers, a row of peppers and a row of tomatoes. Again, with the travel, if we do get the travel, I think we're just going to have a hard time, uh, with that because it's hard to plant, let's say, uh, a row of cucumbers, a row of peppers, and a row of tomatoes on this side of the greenhouse and then do a row of cucumbers, a row of peppers, and a row of tomatoes on this side of the greenhouse. Um, we like to have, you know, all the tomatoes together, all the cucumbers together, all the peppers together. So that's kind of the problem right. there. So I think it's going to have to be what it is. And if we see massive travel, we're just going to see the whole greenhouse level go up. And right. Well, on my farm and most small scale farms, the way I like to operate, um, it depends on how you're doing your plastic mulch. If you're going through yep. uh, drip tape, if you're going through, uh, if you've got an injector that's set up on sprinklers, one of the beautiful things about AgriGrow is it's a, it's, it's tank mixability yep. as well as it's, it, it doesn't, um, uh, a lot of, pro a lot of products, you end up having all kinds of, you know, you're, you're plugging up lines and, Ish and, and it just becomes it comes a, a total mess and um, this product mixes very very easily um, you do want to agitate it but it does go through the whole uh, tank if you're doing a tank mix yeah, um, yeah. so uh, I know this trial that we're running is only for the 16 ounce bottle 
Um, this is a highly, highly concentrated product. Um, when, when I'm doing like a commercial consult for large scale farming, um, most of the applications are going to be 16 ounces of product per acre of ground. Yeah. Um, in the vegetable context, in the home gardener context, it's smaller because we just don't have a way to measure like two drops and yeah. how we're doing yeah. it. Um, you're not going to burn your soil with this. You're not going to overdo it, but you're going to be throwing a little bit more money at it than you necessarily need to. Yeah. And so some of the highest return on investments in application are going to be going through a drip line. Um, yeah. And yeah. If, you've, if you've got some in plastic mulch, a row that you can turn on a line, give it a, give it the, uh, yeah. fertilize that way. That's a great way to do a side by side um, through a drip line, see it and, and have that space in that. Yeah. So, yeah, so we'll be doing strawberries with that. We've got six beds of strawberries, so we'll very easily be able to do three beds with it, three beds without it. Right. Uh, very clear uh, delineation there. Um, we'll be doing winter squash. So we are going to probably be doing this year about an acre of winter squash because we have a really good wholesale customer for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, again, for the retail mm -hmm. store, it's, it's, I mean, it's an easy crop to plant. We've got the acreage this year. It's a very easy crop. Plant it. Forget about it till you harvest it. Right. Um, and that's going to be a very easy trial to do because it's going to be such a big field. We can draw a line right down the middle. Half the drip is going to get this. Half the drip won't. And then the third trial obviously be in the greenhouse with stuff. Oh, the other thing we wanted to do was transplants. So we're going to mix this in with the um, – we buy a custom mixed soil. And um, we're going to actually have them spray this product in the mixer as they're mixing the soil on one batch. The last we'll do it the last batch of the day so it doesn't contaminate the the, the previous the next batch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll do the last batch of the day. Um and uh again, probably you know, in a, a, a yard of soil, what do you think? Like a, a cap full or two? Um yeah, in a yard of soil that I don't, it depends on the size cap. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I would say probably uh Two ounces in okay. two three ounces in a yard of soil would be more than enough. Um, yeah. So we'll be doing that. And with that, we can do very easy A, B. I mean, it's like, you know, you're going to be looking at four week old transplants. I mean, obviously we'll track these transplants all the way through too for the, um, for the, into the ground, because obviously once the transplants in the ground, then it's going to be the, the biobacteria and stuff can kind of like thin it out from there. Um, but I'm really interested in and the other thing which we are actually is I've got a box on the floor right here about to send you is we're going to be trialing seed coating. Right, right. So seed coating is what I I believe is the future of most all agriculture, big scale, small scale. Um, we've already started to see it, you know, just the effects of yeah. uh, coating the seed with a biological stimulant um, of, of any level. That's where a lot of money is being poured into research and data. Um, yeah a lot of money. Uh, every, every genetically modified, uh, corn out there has been coated. Uh, and then they've, they actually add a polymer after it so that they color it a specific color so that they know exactly which seed is what, uh, yeah. and that all of your seed that is pelleted that you get from Johnny's that's probably been coated or treated, um, with some level yeah. of treatment. Um, so I can show you, um, uh, if I can bring this out here, Share screen again. Share screen. Um, this is favorites here. Where are we at there? Are you seeing any of this yet? Not quite yet. Um, application window. Screen share right here. How's that? Uh, yep, I can bring that up now. There we go. So that is um, some, some seed coated corn with the product we're talking about, Ultra. You can see right there my, my wife's handwritten, um, you know, control on the left and yep. uh, the, the Ultra on the right. That is a Promix BX, um, a standard potting mix that most of us use in a greenhouse. Promix BX was the soil medium used, the exact same water. Um, in that greenhouse context, that's where they were placed side by side. That's the difference. Planted the exact same day. Um, and um, how did you put? And that was just the seed coating on the corn. 
Yes, that was just the seed coating on the corn. I can flip that over and then look at the root ball. Yeah. It, as you can see here, the, the left root ball is a much healthier root ball. It, the, the soil wasn't even able to come off. This was rinsed, dipped, tried to come off. Yeah. Uh, these tap nodes on the corn, uh, they're sending down that are along that measuring stick. They're trying to find the nutrients um, yeah. for, for the other nodes to actually deliver that nutrients to the plant. Not able yeah. to find it, even though it's the exact same soil medium. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they are basically, they're expending a massive amounts of energy just trying to find nutrients instead of the other one. Like, hey, we've got nutrients. We're just going to grow to the moon because we've got what we need. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And if, um, you were to, if you were to measure the mass of that root ball, even though those roots are a lot thinner, your yeah. total surface area around those small roots, if you were to stretch that out, uh, yeah. it, it's going to be astronomically um yeah. Larger of a root structure. All right. So we've talked about the product. We've kind of talked about what it is. And this is a certified organic product, Ultra. Yes. Uh, and certified yeah. through Omri. Yep. Yeah. Certified through Omri. And, and um, so uh, and it, what trial is we're doing, I think it's a 16 ounce bottle. And uh, if folks want to join, there's a couple, obviously we're going to talk through like if it's right for you or not, because we don't want people to do this and say, oh, this looks like a cool thing. I'm just going to buy this. We want to make sure we got the right people in the trial that actually give us data back. Because again, we're all about this is only about the data for us this year. I mean, we, again, I'm not endorsing the product per se. I'm saying this is really interesting. I'm really interested. I want to play around with this year on a larger scale. We want some other folks to play around too, so we can see what their farms look like when they add this. And uh, so that's where we're going. Um, so the, uh, I think that the big thing, like, uh, let's talk about the trial, like what the trial is going to be is you buy the product. If you decide to be a part of the trial, you can buy the product, send us the receipt. Um, we'll put you into a special Facebook group and we're going to provide three things for you in there. Okay. First is going to be, we'll look at your soil tests because obviously if you don't have the right power in your soil, you're not going to be able to make this work well for you. So you got to have the right thing. So we're going to, Review your soil test, make sure you got the right aspects there. The second thing is we'll give you some videos and training on how to apply this the best. So I know people are like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. We'll show you how to, you know, hook up the systems, how to apply it, whether it be through, you're going to spray it on or you can put it in through the drip. Um, so we'll give that. And then the third thing is just like, you know, kind of sharing the data back and forth and uh, kind of like looking at that, the other folks' data as well. So we'll be kind of like, as the season progresses, sharing the best practices of what people are seeing and how they're seeing that. Right. And hypothetically, that I mean, this, you, it's not complex to, to do um, in spraying. Like for a seed coating trial, you could literally, if, if you're a home gardener and you're just trying to learn about this and you want to have three tomato plants on your patio in – uh, the Bronx of New York City, you can buy this 16 ounce bottle. You can take one seed, dip it in the, the bottle, put it in your pot. And yeah. then we'll, that is as complex as it needs to be for, yeah. uh, for yeah. a trial and run it next to the other pot. Yeah. And I know, Luke, we, I haven't discussed this with you, but I am sending you enough seed that if there are a few folks that would like some, some seed, some seed, I could probably kick them a few samples of this, this coated seed that you're going to send me back. Right. So, right. Yeah. And that, that is through an, an advanced coating process with a, a seed coating machine that very that has, coating machine. Right. What I do on the farm every day, if I seed out a tray, a 1020 flat, a 512 or whatever, or maybe you're a bootstrap farmer guy and you seed out 72 cells. Yeah. After I put a dibble board over it, after I put my seed there, I mix up a little hand sprayer yep. um, with about a 50-50 solution for a seed coating because I'm trying to make sure I get enough. Yeah. Two or three squirts over the top. I cover it over with my vermiculite yep. or, the, or my surface coating, and then it's done. And those are a coated seed. Super simple. Mm -hmm. um, so what we ask of you guys, so if someone who is interested in this, we need communication throughout the season. So we want to see pictures, good and bad. Because part of the aspect is, again, 
as a business, we exist to help farmers succeed. So if it's not working for you in whatever way it's not working for you, we need to see that because we don't want to tell you, oh, it's great for um, asparagus and it not be right for your farm. So we want to see the good and the bad. We do want to see your soil tests and we do want to see um, yield results too. So yeah. and within, within that, um, I really I can't stress enough making sure you do well, like you don't crisscross yeah we've accidentally done this um, i've done it um we've had you know professional consultants go out there we say hey please make sure you do it we don't go and we actually observe there's stories of guys that were going with peanuts and they they weren't the ones that staked it and we believe they were totally crossed because the one that was labeled for us um was terrible yield and yeah. the one that was labeled for nothing was the best yield they've ever seen better than anything else. And for yeah. whatever reason, they didn't believe that they got crossed yeah. <laughs> and it was yeah. better than every, everything else. So, yeah. yeah, I've actually, you know, I'm, I would sit be the first to admit that I have crossed things and I've cost people lots of money because I've done that. So it's definitely happened. Yeah. My favorite, my favorite is uh, my first year farming, uh, crisscrossing my onions. And okay. not knowing really what I harvested, and I sold Cipollini's to people, telling them it's a great, the sweetest, best onion you've ever had, and it was actually selling Texas candies. And, <laughs> and so I have people coming back after, like <laughs> the next year, saying, "Oh, we need those Cipollini." Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, those are Texas candies. So, um, so I think the thing is, okay, so we talked about like what we're going to do, and I think we should talk about if it's right for them. So. If you're a brand new farmer, this is your first year, you've never really done this before. Um, we, I th And again, this is something we teach across our company, that if you're brand new to farming, you have enough on your plate, you shouldn't be trying to add a research trial as well. It's just not a good fit. Right. Um, and because I endorse the product, you should click the link and buy it for everything. <laughs> Yes, you totally because can. it will really help you out as a first year farmer, especially if you have virgin soil and you're trying to like jumpstart the soil that really help. Um, but yeah, if you're brand new, it's probably not a good thing for you. If you already have like literally a crazy organic, awesome soil, like, you know, feet thick with beautiful earthworms and all that. I don't know. We that's something like the jury's out if that will be incredibly effective for you because it's already so biologically active. If uh, if that is you and you're a very skilled farmer and you're, you're really advanced, I would love to see that take place on the seed coating. Yes. Yeah. To see if we can get, you know, even faster emergence for you, better, better germination, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, if you're an advanced farmer like that, gosh, we'll be very excited to send you some stuff. Cause again, we know that you can get some good data for us. And then if you don't want to submit data either, it's not good for, then you're not a good fit for the trial. Um, right. Yeah, if you're not just saying like I want to get the stuff and I'm just going to be, they're not going to tell you about it. But if you are, you know, have the capacity to do a clear A/B test, if you have challenging soil, I know Luke, I sent you a couple folks, you've been talking to them that are like really struggling, and so this is where it really, really helps is if you have some challenging stuff, be able to send you some really good um, stuff. Yeah, and, and and for this particular group, I will be available. Um, in both my email and, and phone call, we can have some conversations and yeah, and really see where you're at and, and you can connect with me in that way. My email is very simple. So Yeah. And again, both of us don't do this normally. Um, like I'll be in the group too. I usually do not do that kind of stuff except with our very, uh, very highly paid clients that work with us. But because kind of like we're trying to figure this out as well, we see, you know, again, if this does what we think it will, the potential is there to really help farmers. So that's why we're, we're really di diving into this kind of on the passion project side of things. Um, so yeah, I think that's it folks. If you got some questions in the field, toss those in the comments, we'll drop the link if you want to. So basically what, what agro is offering, it's only on the pint because the pint is going to give you plenty to do a lot of trials. Again, we said it's a pint, an acre uh, for treatment, right, Luke? Yeah. So if you want, you know, again, we're going to be doing a couple smaller tests. So we'll be able to, that will easily do you for a full year. Um, they are giving 20% off until, is it the Sunday we're giving 20% off till? Yeah, I think till midnight on Sunday or something like that. Yeah, midnight on Sunday. 
Um, we've got a coupon code for you folks. We'll drop the link in the chat for you guys. And then um, anyone who uh, clicked to join this one will also follow up with an email probably Saturday that I'll kind of do the, the bullet point for you all to kind of give you guys a kind of a detail about how that's going to work. Right. Um, and uh, make sure you use the coupon code, which we've got linked right below the button. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it, folks. Sweet. Any other questions? We'll jump it on. We hit an hour on the nose. I said that last word. It was fifty nine fifty nine. It's because we're super punctual. <laughs> we did join about like thirty seconds late. I think. Do we have anybody left with us? <laughs> we have. Yes, we have the faithful few left with us at the end here. Um, but yeah, I know it's a, a Friday night. Most people are probably out, you know, drinking in the. The bar are these the, the states that don't have COVID restrictions are probably drinking in bars tonight. <laughs> but um, but yeah, um, so yeah, if you do have questions, and again, if you have further questions, um, you know, Luke and I will uh, be available by email. You guys have our emails, um, Luke. We can put your email on the, the page too, probably. I can just add that somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that kind of wraps it up. If you guys have any more questions, reach out to us. Otherwise, we are gonna call it a night and um, head on to the next thing. Cool deal. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Sean, for showing up. Thank you, Mike, for hanging out with us. Really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited for this. I mean, we're, as I said, we've already been trialing it ourselves on some, some different things and uh, seeing some really interesting results. So I'm kind of excited, really excited, especially in the greenhouse loop, because it's going to be a brand new, um, a brand new, uh, it's like the earthwork is still getting done. And actually like on the, while we were on the call, I got the final quote in for our groundwork because they're going to come out and they're basically going to tear the whole site up and then we're putting in, you know, brand new stuff. So um, I'm really interested to kind of put the, the AB test on that. And I, you know, I'm going to say it right now because if I don't say it publicly, it might not happen. Is I will give you a full crop trial the a b aspect i'm not going to mid-season like see the massive difference and add everything to the trial just because i i, I need to, the growth so i will do an entire season for that because i think that'll be right. important to have that so i right. said it here you can hold me to it luke uh will do because you know i i I'm always going for the highest yields <laughs> you're gonna get excited i think i think for sure yeah. Okay, folks. Well, you guys have a great night. Thanks for hanging out with us. We appreciate it. And uh, we will chat with you guys at another point. Cool. Farm on.